Everybody knows about the great industrial revolution and great agricultural revolution. Now, no less great informational revolution is coming, and it will huge impact on workforce, on, on everything. Every revolution removes some distinctions in the society and creates new ones. The informational revolution probably, it's only my opinion, will create big distinction between educated people and less educated people. Uh, about uh, the impact on the workforce, look at the number of uh, people who, were, who worked in agriculture at the beginning of the 20th century and look now. The, so the uh, informational revolution is not only artificial intelligence, but artificial intelligence is what everybody talks about. And artificial intelligence is rooted in mathematics. It grew out of mathematics. But it, it was a small area inside of mathematics mm, not very prestigious and far from the frontiers. And it was, uh, the name was modest and precise. It was known as pattern recognition in multidimensional spaces, which it is. So artificial intelligence was a touch of market genius. And then powerful computers arrived and changed everything. Suddenly, it became a key to self-driving cars, medical imaging, market analytics, everything, everything. I would say that mathematically, the whole area is still in its infancy. It became so important largely because of brutal force of, model compu of modern computers. Mathematically, the mathematical side of artificial intelligence, a very important side, largely consists of two things, big data and machine learning. What is big data? Oh, roughly speaking, it is the same classical problems that we studied in the course of linear algebra, but on a huge scale. Imagine that you have to solve the system of equations, but the size of the matrix uh, beats imagination. And to make things worse, the entries are not known precisely. They are known up to a certain error. One engineer added at this moment once, and you also don't know precisely the size of matrices, okay. If you go with a classical Gauss's method, it gives you computational complexity of n cubed. It cannot be realized even with the most up-to-date supercomputers. It's impossible. But fortunately, in matrices, that arise in practical problems, most entries are equal to zero. They are sparse matrices. So it is a very important area now how to deal with sparse matrices and if we can do better than n cubed. And this is now intensively studied because it's also my personal experience. No matter where we start, in biology, cryptology, or <laughs> anywhere else, very often the problem boils down to this, to solution of equations with sparse matrices. And this is a bottleneck. It takes most of the time. And the second direction is machine learning. It tries to imitate human learning by trial and error. And uh, since 
the act of learning is uh, checking, usually checking some inequalities, it boils down to the same problem. And clearly, this area will stay at the center of applied mathematics at least till the end of the century. Now, uh, though a great technological engine, mathematics is more than that. Mathematics is art. What do I mean? First of all, in experimental sciences, the criterion of truth is repetition of experiment. Whatever you say, whatever you claim, has to be independently confirmed in other laboratories. In mathematics, criteria of truth is proof. I should throw out Her Majesty proof. One of the top mathematicians of the 20th century, John von Neumann, once said, and don't mention it to me, because this concept changed several times during my lifetime. Bowing to join von Neumann, I want to say that, uh, on the other hand, the concept of proof is amazingly stable. If you look at the book of Euclid, written more than 2,000 years ago, the proofs in that book are still proofs. So what is a proof? Again, I will say something for what, for, for what I was much criticized on the internet. <laughs> there is a formal definition of a proof as a sequence of deductions leading from axioms. I have been in the profession for 45 years. I have never seen such proofs. <laughs> Basically, in the, if you go down to the earth, a proof is what is viewed as a proof by all mathematicians. And they should better agree on that. You know, there are examples of very long proofs done by top mathematicians that have been hanging around for years and years. And then nobody can say if it's a proof or not. At the end, and other top mathematicians raise some doubts, objections, and that's it. It's not considered as a proof any longer. So mathematicians act as a single mind. Uh, mathematicians in different countries work on the same problems. They come to the same conclusions, which also create some problems sometimes. But what is the purpose of the proof? The purpose of the proof is understanding. For mathematicians, it's not enough to know that something is correct or not correct. They need to know why it is correct or not correct. That's why I'm slightly skeptical of computer-checked proofs. Because even if some uh, group of programmers tells me that some proof, for some reason, is correct, but I don't understand why. Uh, that's not satisfactory. They say that they checked it. Who will check them? Mathematicians need to understand. A, a proof can be beautiful or ugly. And if you listen to a conversation between two mathematicians, um, you may think that they are artists. Because this is beautiful, this is not. And probably this is true for all sciences. Maybe in mathematics it is slightly more pronounced. For those who are inside, what they do is art. It is their guiding stars. They go in the direction which they perceive is more beautiful. Now, what is beauty in mathematics? Well, beauty is always in the eyes of a beholder, we know. But there are several common features, like mathematicians like a simple statement and a complicated and deep proof, like Fermat problem, 
like unexpected ideas that come from maybe a different areas, and some generality, because the same ideas show up in different contexts. And the golden standard of beauty in mathematics is Galois theory. This is supposed to be a picture of Galois. Let me say something, some words about Galois. Galois was a French teenager living at the beginning of the 19th century. He never had any formal education, well, except the school. He twice failed entrance exams to the university. People who knew him say that it happened because he knew mathematics much better than his examiners and never made any attempt to hide it. <laughs> he was killed at the age of 20 on a duel. Since he had no illusions about his ability to shoot and could predict the outcome of the duel, the night before the duel, he wrote a very detailed mathematical letter to his friend. So his mathematics stayed with us. And another top mathematician of the 20th century, Hermann Weil, called this work of Galois the most important paper in mathematics ever. So what did Galois do? And by the way, this is complete nonsense, that this is a picture of Galois. Nobody knows how he looked. Who would bother to make a portrait of a strange teenager? He was not interesting to anybody, and no selfies. So we don't know how he looked. And this inspired face is a fantasy of an artist. Well, depending on how, long, how much time ago you finished high school, you may remember how to solve quadratic equations. Hmm? Formula. Now there exists a similar formula for cubic equation and for equation of degree four. Nobody remembers this formula. Nobody ever uses them. But they exist, okay. And for many years, people tried to find a similar formula for an equation of degree five, unsuccessfully. And after many years of attempts, they started to wonder if such a formula exists. The first credible attempt to solve, to prove that it does not exist, was made by Paolo Ruffini, Italian mathematician. But his proof was, contained a gap. And as we know, a proof with a gap is not a proof. All his life, he tried to patch this gap unsuccessfully. But it was the first credible attempt. The first correct proof was found by another young genius who died young, Niels Henrik Abel. So what did Galois do? Galois gave us understanding. He explained what, what's really going on. Following the idea of Lagrange, we should give credit to Lagrange. Lagrange analyzed existing formulas and he was the first who wrote that really these formulas and the answer depend on symmetries of roots. This was a key word, symmetry. Since then, all attempts to prove non-existence of the formula went through analysis of symmetries. And that led to the appearance of a new area of mathematics, group theory. Because the concept of a group, it's a so it catches the notion of symmetry. Whatever, symmet whatever uh, you have a complicated object, and 
you can talk about symmetries of this object, some transformation, some turning of the object that maps it to itself. And these symmetries follow some general rules. You can do one symmetry after another symmetry. It's like a multiplication. You can invert symmetries. It's inversion. And there is a wonderful symmetry that does not move anything, like identity. So that was the beginning of group theory. When in, at the beginning of the 20th century, physicists started to study elementary particles, they knew which questions to ask. They asked the question of Galois. What au Lagrange? What are the groups of symmetries? That's how they distinguished elementary particles. One of the fathers of the standard model, Sheldon Glashow, said, I don't know, maybe it wasn't him who said this phrase. I heard it from him. He said, I don't know if God exists, but if he exists, then he knows group theory. It was about elementary particles. Okay, and now uh, another quotation from Hermann Weil. I want, since it is a quotation, I will read it. My work has always tried to unite the true with the beautiful. And when I had to choose one or the other, look, choose, true and beautiful didn't coincide. <laughs> I usually chose the beautiful. And here is the illustration. This is the real photo of Hermann Weil. After Einstein's papers on relativity theory, Weil wrote a beautiful paper that unified gravitation and electromagnetic fields. And he sent it to physics journal. The editor-in-chief was Max Planck. And naturally, Max Planck sent it to Albert Einstein for refereeing. And Einstein could see some experimental connections of Weil's theory, and experiment did not confirm it. So he wrote that the paper is beautiful, but wrong. And Planck did an amazing thing. In the same volume, he published the wrong paper of Weil and the referee report of Einstein. Ten years after that, well, in some new theories uh, related to quantum mechanics and Gauge invariance, that is, if you feel Weil's model with the different contents, it worked perfectly. Now, how do mathematicians know what is beautiful and what is not? Are in the same way in which you know which music is beautiful and which is not. You know, students of, in art schools copy great paintings. Why? Just to know what is beautiful. Mathematicians study the papers of, great, of, of greats and they develop taste in the same way as musicians develop taste by listening to musics of great masters. I think that this is a function of time. I'm not sure that all modern beautiful musics would be considered as being beautiful in the time of Mozart. Probably the same is true for mathematics. Tastes change. And uh, mathematics, speaking of arts, mathematics is a very elitist art. You know, hundreds of millions of people can enjoy Giaconda or some other beautiful painting. How many people can enjoy a paper in algebraic number theory? Maybe 10. 
At the same time, it is the best supported art. It is support, at least in the United States, it is supported not by the endowment for arts and humanities, which is, has always been short of money, and maybe even the previous administration closed it at all. I don't know. Uh, mathematics is supported by industry, by defense ministry. <laughs> Why? Why do they do it? The biggest employer of specialists in algebra and number theory in the world, I don't know numbers in China, but in, in the United States, is the National Security Agency of the United States. So why do they do it? Let's consider some examples which can give an idea why do they do it. Among other things, Galois invented finite fields. You know, what is good about real numbers and complex numbers? You can do many things with them. You can add them, multiply, divide by a non-zero number, and they follow certain rules. And Galois invented finite systems which enjoyed all these wonderful properties. For 150 years, it was viewed as a kind of joke of a genius. When I was a student, 45 years ago, we were taught that real world is real numbers and complex numbers. Only decadent number theorists and algebraists can be interested in finite fields. And I also must confess that I perfectly understand why Galois worked on solution of equations and radicals. At that time, everybody worked on solution of equations and radicals. I don't understand why did he do finite fields. He was a genius. You know. OK, the simplest example of a finite field, especially for high school students. Let P be a prime number. You know what's a prime number. Every number can be divided by that prime number with a reminder. Reminders run from 0 to p minus 1. OK. So there are exactly p reminders, 0, 1, 2, 3, up to p minus 1. Now we will add and multiply these reminders as though they were numbers. Given two reminders, and we want to add them, we add them, but maybe the sum will be bigger than p, in which case it's not a reminder. OK, we, will again, we again divide it by p with a reminder. And we say that that reminder is a, a sum of i plus j. For example, let p be equal to 5. Then 2 plus 4 is equal to 1. Why 1? Because 2 plus 4 is 6. You divide 6 by 5, the remainder is 1. So 2 plus 4 is 1. In the same way, 2 times 4 is 3. Divide 8 by 5. The remainder is 3. And all the laws of, not all, but many laws of uh, real and complex numbers are true for this finite system. Now, some applications. We start with error-correcting codes. Suppose that we send a satellite, and the satellite transmits signals. A signal is a sequence of zeros and ones. But on the way, it is subject to noises, and uh, you always get it with an error. So what you get is not what was sent. The following scheme was invented. I don't know who personally invented it. I think it was invented in Bell Laboratories in the 50s. Shannon. Or we can see, no, 0 and 1 
I remain this modular too. So there are elements of the field of Galois consisting of two elements. A sequence is an n-tuple. And those who studied linear algebra know that if you consider n-tuples over some field, it's a vector space. I apologize to high school students for using these words. Go to the university, study linear algebra, <laughs> you will know what are vector spaces. Uh, on the Earth, we decide that all signals will be taken only from a certain subspace, which is called a code. So if you get a signal which does not lie in that subspace, it means that there was a mistake. Now what do you do? You choose the closest element in the subspace, hoping that that was the intentional message. Closest. What does it mean? It means that you need to define a distance. OK, given n tuples, we define the distance as the number of positions where they are different, so-called Hamming distance. But then you want all your elements in the code to be far from each other. Otherwise, you may get two points that are the closest. So it is called the minimal distance between distinct elements. It's called Hamming weight. Good code is a code with large Hamming weight. And now I want to give an example of an amazing code. What is amazing is that it exists, Golay code. The size of a message is 24. So the dimension of the space is 24. The dimension of the subspace is 12. And Hamming weight is 8. Well, after all, now it's not so important how we get this subspace, but it exists. And <coughs> when Americans set, sent a satellite to Jupiter and Saturn, Golay code was used to decode the messages from this satellite. And in the United States, I give more examples from the United States because I come from there. Well, now. Uh, it is a United States standard for uh, high frequency radio. And in pure mathematics, it, is, it has numerous applications. The group of automorphism is an exceptional Mathieu group. It is used in the construction of the biggest sporadic simple group, the monster. It is used in conformal field theory in physics, in sphere packing everywhere. It is just an amazing phenomenon of the nature, Golay code. Another example, public cryptography. In the old times, when one general needed to send an encrypted letter to another general, they agreed on some page in a very thick book, a warrant piece, and uh, using that page, they made a letter. It was very difficult to write this encrypted letter. It was difficult to read it, but it was also very difficult to, to break it anyway. That was the method. And then the new times came. Each time when you log in to your email account, you exchange a secret message with your internet provider. Each time when you get money from ATM machine, you exchange a secret message with your bank. It's billions of people and billions and billions of secret messages. Old methods just did not work. So at the beginning of 70s, mathematicians came up with a solution. And this solution was entirely based on finite fields of Galois. Fortunately, they knew mathematics. I will explain the Diffie-Hellman protocol. 
It was actually published two years even before than Diffie Hellman, but uh, not in open journal. Suppose that Alice and Bob want to exchange some information. And Catherine is a hacker. She hears everything that they send to each other and don't read too much in names, it's just ABC. Another uh, scheme was suggested by Rivas Shamir and Edelman. Anyway, so let P be a prime number, usually a very big prime number. You will see why. Then all remainders are here, 0, 1, 2, up to P minus 1. You throw away 0, and the remaining non-zero remainders form a group with respect to multiplication. I already mentioned groups in Galois theory and particle physics. A group means that a product of two non-zero reminders is again a non-zero reminder that for each of them there is an inverse. Inverse of A is one divided by A. Hmm? Certain rules are satisfied. Moreover, Galois proved that this group is a cyclic group. So there exists some very special element, more than one, such that all elements in this group are powers of this element. Everybody knows these elements. So let G be, they are called generators. Let G be this generator. Both Alice and Bob choose some secret numbers that they don't show to anybody. Alice chooses A and, B choose, and Bob chooses B. Now Alice takes the generator that everybody knows to the power of her secret number A and sends it to Bob. Bob gets this g to the power a and takes it to the power of his secret number, and he gets g to the power a b. Okay. Then Bob does the same. He takes g to the power of his secret number, sends it to Alice. Alice takes it to the power of her secret number, and she also knows g to the power a b. They share this secret. What about Catherine? Catherine knows. Every, she knows G because everybody knows G. She knows G to the power A because Alice sent it to Bob. She knows G to the power B because Bob sent it to Alice. But in order to know G to the power AB, she needs to know A and B. If they were real numbers, she would take a calculator, take logarithm, and that's it. But these are not real numbers. These are elements of the finite Galois field. And so we are coming to the problem of discrete logarithm. How to take logarithms in Galois fields? And nobody knows how to do it. Of course, there is uh, exhaustion. Just let's try all numbers up to a certain. And uh, maybe one of them will fit. But that's why the prime number P is very big. It's not easy. There are re good reasons to believe that if, if and when and if quantum computers are built, then for them it will be easier to do this problem. But uh, they do not exist at the moment. And it's a bit like cold fusion. Nobody knows when they will be, when will they be built, if ever. And if after they are built, nobody knows their properties. So, so far it works pretty well. Also, you know, a very strong player, like a state, with access to supercomputers, can do it. Just by exhaustion, by brutal force. But if you are an ordinary person, who will, who will do that with your secrets? Uh, if you are not an ordinary person, you will protect your secrets better. Another 
application which is used, it's an encryption system of iPhone and uh, probably all other smartphones, Rindal, or Advanced Encryption Standard. In 2001, uh, National Security Agency of the United States announced an open competition for a best encryption system. It was won by two Dutch mathematicians, Diamond and Ridgman. Here is the solution. The message is a four by four matrix. Now, what are entries? You know, a bit is zero or one. A byte, uh, yeah, byte is a sequence of eight bits. So how many bytes do we have? Two to the power eight, 256. Galois proved that every finite field has order, which is a power of a prime number. And for every power of a prime number, there exists only one up to isomorphism finite field of that order. So there exists a finite field of the order 256. There are many ways to construct it. And entries in this matrix will be elements from this field. Okay. Now to encrypt it, we do some elementary transformations. We add some columns to another columns, rows to another rows. We add key to this matrix. If it were only that, they would not win the competition. At some point, we do what they call S-box. What is S-box? We invert all elements. You see an element A, we write one over A. Now you may ask, what if it was zero? <coughs> one divided by zero is equal to zero. <laughs> I will explain, it's for good reason. Because it comes back to the question, how do you find an inverse? It's a difficult problem. If you go over all other elements and check if they are inverses, it will take too much time. But if you go to a university and take a course of abstract algebra and uh, learn Lagrange theorem, you will know that in a finite group of order n, the inverse is a just power of n minus 1. The group here has order 255, so inverse is a to the power 254. It's much easier to take powers than to look for inverses. That's why the inverse of zero is zero. Ah, before I say that, uh, about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I don't remember, there was a terrorist act in San Bernardino, California. And FBI wanted to read the telephone, iPhone of the terrorist. And Apple refused to provide keys. So they broke it. But I said a very strong player can do it just by brutal force. Another example. Johann Radon was an Austrian mathematician, well, well known. He was a member of Austrian Academy of Sciences. He worked in Czech Republic. At that time, it was the same country. And in 1917, he published a paper. Uh, the paper was a way to recover functions by integrals through, through straight lines. It was a very good paper. But it did not make a splash. People publish papers. And then in 1970, Cormac and Hounsfield invented tomograph, which was entirely based on Radon's formulas. If Radon were alive, he would certainly share it. Because you, you sent an X-ray. And you can, you know, uh, if you take the difference 
of, uh, at the entrance and at the exit point, you can measure the integral of density. And by Radon's formulas, you can recover density. And then you can see what happens inside of your brain or anywhere. Now, too much, it's wonderful, but too much X-rays is not good for some people, for pregnant women. So they try to use ultrasound instead of X-ray. But ultrasound is weaker. It does not go straight. It goes along certain curves. And there are no Radon formulas for integrals over curves. That's why ultrasound tomography is much weaker. The, pu the problem is purely mathematical. And this is a, a photo of Radon. Uh, another application of these methods is geology. You can see what happens <laughs> under the earth. Uh, now some general remarks. At the beginning of the 20th century, there happened an abstract revolution in mathematics. If you compare mathematical papers before 20th century and mathematical papers after, they are different. Mathematics was rearranged around abstract notions like group, manifold, homology. Why was it? It became practically impossible to tell a person without a special mathematical education, what do we do? It also led to a division between the so-called pure mathematics and the so-called applied mathematics. At some university, because before, nobody asked this question about Euler or Gauss, if they were pure or applied. Come on. They were both. Uh, and then some departments even split in the department of applied mathematics and often <clears throat> and the department of pure <laughs> mathematics. Uh, or um, some state in the same department. So people ask. I gave you examples of some big applications. Can you tell in advance which area will lead to big applications and just spend our resources developing these areas? The point is that it is impossible. Uh, Galois theory became <laughs> state useless for 150 years. And now all financial transactions in the world, <laughs> trillions of dollars, are done on the basis of Galois fields. It is impossible. And besides, Mathematics is like a plant. If you decide that I eat this part of the plant, that's why let's keep them, and let us cut other parts which I don't eat, the plant will die. All, all areas, are, they feed each other. If, you, if we had a chance to ask Galois or Adon, or even Jim Simons, who ran the very successful hedge fund, who is a multi-billionaire, if they are pure mathematicians or applied mathematicians, all three would say that they are pure. Uh, you know, uh, it's written, we had history of science in the Soviet Union, not to forget. In searches, Soviet mathematics was great, and Soviet biology was one of the top in the world. Then the government decided that biology has to serve agriculture. So they have to help them. That is to support those biologists who do uh, things related to agriculture. And for others, well, th they removed them in the way in which they used to remove people. Executed. 
Now, the Soviet Union collapsed in, with mathematics. They even didn't understand what these people are talking about. So in 91, the country collapsed. Mathematics was still one of the best in the world. There was neither biology nor agriculture in the country. <laughs> because these parts of genetic selection that they removed in the rest of the world turned out the most productive. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, new challenges arise, big data, machine learning, and so far, they will, mathematically, it's undeveloped. But it will be developed because there are big demands to do it. And I want to finish with the phrase of a prominent physicist, Eugene Wigner. He called it unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics. Every word has a meaning. Unreasonable. So it shouldn't be. But effectiveness. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for your wonderful and very appealing talk. And now I would like to ask if uh, there are people in the audience who would like to ask uh, a question to Professor Selmanov. Just raise your hand. <laughs> OK. Uh, professional mathematicians allowed to ask questions? <laughs> Maybe I'm not allowed, yeah. but I take the occasion. When you, when you put the name Cardano after the solution of the cubic equation, that's a bit controversial in northern Italy. Yes. I just want to say this. And this I thing. know, it was done by somebody, Tartaglia. Well, at least he claimed he did it before Cardano, but Cardano published it. But then they found out that they even, in Padua, there was one who even found the solution earlier, I thought. Yeah, it's yes, true. it's not only in Italy. I heard about it. But apparently Cardano gave a reference. So... <laughs> yeah, there are. There is somebody else over there. Hello. Thank you. Um, at the beginning of the talk, you said that you are skeptical to a certain point of proofs that are supported by computers, by computation. Does that mean also that you're somewhat acceptable of the, the principle of induction? Because to, the principle of induction doesn't either tell you why something is true. It just only tells you that if the, the piece falls at the beginning, it will keep falling. No, I'm not skeptical about the principle of induction. But I am a big skeptical about uh, computer-checked proofs. Because there are proofs. It's a new phenomenon in mathematics. Now, more and more, there are proofs that are more than 500 pages long. And uh, even to read this proof, you need to spend the, uh, several years of your life. But you are not paid for it. You are supposed to do your job. Mm. So uh, the purpose of mathematics is understanding. If it was a really important result, then hopefully later uh, new ideas will appear and the same result will be viewed, will be understood. No, there was a very big problem with classification of finite simple groups. The full uh, proof is more than 10,000 pages. It's a big problem to find a new approach. Giving all credit to uh, the old approach, which I believe, still, it is important to continue research on this subject. 
in order to, for better, to achieve better understanding. Hi, thank you for the talk. So, I mean, I want to play devil's advocate. Uh, you said that some computer check proofs are not so appealing, but what do you think of computer assisted, assisted, assisted proofs? So, for example, the four color, color problem is, you know, you, it has a very long proof, and it's been reduced to a problem which is checked by a computer. Well, do you find that beautiful? I, tr I trust computer computations more than human computations. <laughs> and if a problem involves a lot of computations, like, say, four color problems, then yes. Uh, subtle arguments, you would like to have understanding. If a computer produces a counterexample, wonderful. Well, there is no reason not, usually it's easily checkable. Yeah, examples, yes. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask you for, <laughs> For uh, given we have we have been discussing the the relation between math and art, or or even identifying them too, no, being mathematics uh, part of an art. What are your thoughts in the creative process behind mathematics, during uh, mathematics? Can you? What are your thoughts about the creative process? It's a really general question. In, in mathematics. In yeah, some thoughts, I guess. Well, that creative problems in process in mathematics. It, you know, that's why I think that artificial intelligence is not an intelligence at all. It's just a catchy word. Intelligence and creativity is some divine sparkle. <laughs> it's impossible to, I don't, I, I cannot put it in words. Some, maybe on the basis of your previous intuition or experience, but Look at Galois. He didn't have much experience. Or divine sparkle, which a computer doesn't have. To say divine sparkle is to avoid an answer, I understand. <laughs> but I cannot say it in a more detailed way. <laughs> Any other questions? So perhaps as a group theorist myself, I would like to, I would like to ask you a question, your opinion about the future of group theory, right? Because you mentioned how important group theory is and has been. Actually also mathematics has trends. Uh, group theory was a very trendy topic in the 20th century, as you mentioned, the classification of finite simple groups. Yeah. If you take a volume of Journal of Algebra, one of the, I mean, this was like 1960s, it was founded, and most of the papers are about group theory. Now other topics have taken, and it is normal, right, because algebra has so many fields. Uh, you can see many, you work also on, on algebras, right? Algebras have taken a lot of, uh, and now it seems group theory is not so trendy, but what do you think? about the future, but, uh, what is your the opinion? But group theory will be there as long as mathematic, mathematics will exist. Uh, because, um, you know, group theory in some sense also a service area, it studies symmetries of all objects. And new objects arise and they will be studied from group theoretical point of view. It is one of the basic concepts through, like Kantian glasses, through which we view uh, mathematics. Once a new object, a new uh, concept is introduced, we try to formulate in terms of some group maybe acts on it. So it will be forever. But in mathematics there are trendy areas each time. I could give several examples during my lifetime when everybody rushes to some area and then in 10 years they all leave. Like, you know, that's the way wild dogs hunt. That's, that will be, there was a time when everybody rushed to group theory. Then many people 
left, but the subject will be there forever. Hope so. <laughs> so thank you all for attending, and let's thank Professor Selmanov again for his thank you. <laughs>